Um, so good morning, guys. Thank you. We have today with us, oh, we'll say this week with us, two cracks. Uh, two guys that they are probably push your company a little bit for, uh, further uh, if you haven't been. So uh, we have uh, Fabian Dietrich. He is uh, an adventurer, he's an entrepreneur, and he's a speaker. So I will shut up today. I will not say anything because he's much better than I am. He started a company called uh, Helpando, or do you pronounce it like that? Helpando.it. Yeah, that works. Uh, in uh, Berlin, right? Yeah, we don't really have a base, but yeah. Oh, that's part of the concept. He's a nomad in his uh, ground. And this is something that I would like to uh, to get a, a little more of a view about how he does, because I need to understand much better. Also, he um, a, he's a TEDx speaker, so you can check it out also, uh, his talk. I, I did one, uh, The Art of Designing, your path to right. the future or something like that, which I love it. It's all gonna be in this talk too, so you don't have to watch it anymore. Okay, <laughs> it's great. Um, he's on his way to Africa. So uh, in the beginning, he was thinking about taking a boat and cross the ocean, um, but uh, he has a client somewhere in Africa, so he will spend some time in Africa before going there. So he's driving a four by four, quite amazing Land Rover. And yeah, you have it there. <laughs> so time is yours. I mean, take whichever time you need. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. If you don't mind, I, I will enjoy there. Yeah. So cool. So hey, Thank guys. You. Thanks for coming. And nice to meet you all. Um, this works. So usually when I give a talk, I am aim to inspire people and to, you know, talk about how to live lives more aligned to one's passions and, and dreams or whatever. But I, I, I figured with you guys, I don't have to do the same because you're already kind of on your own way I would think or you're at least innovators and, and dreamers so instead today I would just like to share my story and how I got to the place where I'm right now and basically that's always the story of following serendipity and taking advantage of, of opportunities sometimes very random opportunities so I tell you what my life looks like at the moment um, this is my business partner, Dominic, and this was my travel partner, Ben. And uh, we run a company together, and we consistently generate something between thirty and $40,000 uh, a month, and we have very low costs. These are some of our clients. There's some big ones like Virgin Atlantics, and we deal with some quite some corporate um, customers uh, here and there. The things that we offer, we help clients to improve their customer service by helping them to use tools like cloud-based tools like Zendesk uh, in the best way. So we do data migrations for them. We migrate from one system to the target system, which usually is uh, Zendesk. We do Zendesk consultancy, uh, so we go into a company. We don't go there, but we do it virtually. And look at the processes and how they can improve their customer support via cloud-based uh, tools. Uh, we build custom apps for them, we uh, design the health centers and adapt their FAQ systems from the look and feel to their corporate identity and we train the agents sometimes. So this is the services that we that we offer as a company. This is uh, my bed in my office at the moment. I just came driving down here from Berlin to um, Malaga and soon keeping keep going on to uh, Senegal. And uh, this is how I work a lot. Uh, this is how I ate the last days. So this is like a camping cooker. And at the moment I work like three hours a day, but sometimes it's also zero and sometimes it's 16. So it really depends on how much work is coming in. Um, but usually I work on this thing there. It's a flexible roof and I love to work there because I like to have this small space where there's no distractions. When I'm in Berlin, I, I'm so distracted, but then this thing I can really work uh, very well. Now, you know, in this, I, I, will, I will explain how I got there. And I figure we have an hour together, so we split it in three parts. One is the story, how I got where I am now, and then the next part is like pragmatic hints and tricks and, and things you can, you can use to work more efficiently, and then we can do some questions and, and answers. So, 
um, through this whole adventure, I picked up a lot of tricks and trips, uh, <laughs> trips, uh, tricks, how to work more efficiently. And uh, yeah, I speak about that soon. So I want to start my story with something you can probably relate to. The past May, I gave this TED talk. Um, Diego took this picture, by the way, in Bogota, the capital of uh, Colombia. And as soon as TED released the talk, the first thing I did was not being really happy, but of course, sharing it on Facebook. And the first person that commented was actually my father. Does this has happened to you, by the way, that your parents join Facebook and just to see what you're up to? And then they have three friends, which is you and your brother and your sister, and they leave this weird comments. In this case, it wasn't too weird. It's in German. But my father actually said something like, my English is not quite good anymore, but I think I got the essence of your story, which is that even you walked far off the off-beaten path, you were successful. And then I said, well, thanks, Dad. The question is, is it because I walk, is it even because I walked far off the off-beaten path or just exactly because of that, that I did what I did, right? So it was a big difference in perspective. My father said or thought that it was funny that even I didn't walk the normal path, I had success and I thought it's exactly because of that. So that's a huge uh, difference in perspective. And I had a similar experience when I was 15, this career counselor was sent to schools in Germany. Now somebody told me they still do that. So it's a guy from the uh, Arbeitsamt, the, some, some uh, job institution, and they send some guy to you into the school when you're 15 and then they try to teach you things like it's very important that you have a linear CV and it's very important that you have no gaps in your CV and you have to have a consistent, the, the future employees have to see uh, the consistency in your life decisions. And I was thinking, what the hell is going on there? There was a guy coming to a 15, 15 year olds and we were listening to Guns N' Roses and Nirvana at that time. And they said we should live our lives so we become a more employable entity, right? So I'm a big believer that uh, this kind of times are over. And there's so many people who, and role models, who dropped out of the line and did amazing things. More than many times from the garages, like um, those guys. And, you know, I believe that if you, it sounds a bit cliche, but follow your heart and live your life aligned to whatever you want to do, then usually something good comes out of it and it brings you to fascinating places. So. This is where I was four months ago. It was somewhere in the desert in Peru. And together with my business partner, Dominic, who's responsible for project management and, and handling clients. And he's also really good at going to pee in the desert and find bones, which then Vin, who is uh, responsible for the logistics in Startup Diaries, uh, is very good at putting in his hair. Uh, we were pretty stuck in the sand. And we were running our company from this Land Rover Defender. As you can see, it has solar panels and a flexible roof and exactly at this moment we took this picture we were in a super hurry because we had two hours to make it to a go live call with uh, one of our with our biggest clients so far they were paying us like a five amount five digit amount to um for zenders implementation and that was the go live call so it was the moment where we would have the final call and then they would switch the button and use the system that we had configured for them so this is how we got out of the sand. Uh, we, we first tried digging, but then we found out we had this winch, this mechanical device here in the front of the car, which we never used before, but then we found there was this tree stump. I don't know why, but we managed to get out of the, out of the desert like this. And so this race against time started. Um, our engine overheated, but then we made it and we found two cyber coffees in some desert town in, in, in uh, near the Nazca lines and we split. So this is Dominic in one <laughs> cyber coffee and I was in the one next to him to not use the full bandwidth. And there was all these kids playing Counter-Strike and listening to reggaeton music, so it was really loud. And I had a headset, so every time the client um, was talking, I pressed mute so that they wouldn't hear this machine guns and sounds of war. And after 20 minutes, I was really happy that it was over because it was successful and the client was happy and the project was done it was signed off and at that moment i realized that it was like this movie going in front of my mental eyes right i i was looking 
to the right here because there was chicken running around outside. Our car was parked, there was chicken, chicken running around. And then I zoomed out mentally and I saw like the place where we slept the night before at the Pacific Ocean and I zoomed out more and I saw the Nazca line which are close to that place. And by the way, this company we were talking to was an online casino in Las Vegas. So I would, I would see us sitting there, we hadn't showered for three days and we were wearing flip-flops. And then I zoomed out more and rotated the planet a bit and saw the Las Vegas and I went into the office of the company passing by the secretary and then I saw these two men and one woman in a conference room with a table microphone in the middle and wearing suit and tie and then I went to my hometown no? which is Detmold. Is anybody German here? No? All right. And I saw the career counselor sitting there who came to our class at 50 and I was thinking dude your, your advice really needs an update is that it was so different from anything that anybody told us that how we could do work. And it's, it's these moments where I realize how lucky we are to be in this trip, not of being this nomad company and being able to work the way we work and living all these adventures that we do meanwhile. So basically I got here by believing in always doing what I really wanted to do at that time and not really having a plan and engaging into serendipity. And if you want to know the story, here, here it goes really quickly. It all started in 2006. I was studying um, computer science and I had no idea what, how I could use anything I learned to make a living. But I had a funny friend and his hobby was he used a fake press card, an old fake press card, to sneak into expensive conferences to eat there for free and to network. So he called me one day and was like, hey Fabian, I'm at this Ruby on Rails conference in, uh, in the Hyatt Hotel. And I was like, Ruby on what? I didn't know what it is at that time. It was fairly new in 2006. But free food sounded good. And so I went to this conference and I was standing at the buffet putting all these heaps of free salmon on my plate where a recruiter standing next to me who paid like $800 to be on this conference asked me if I wanted to have a job working in Ruby on Rails. And I pretended, you know, fake it till you make it is one of my favorite concepts. I pretended that I had some experience and accepted to work two days each week next to my studies in this company in Ruby and Red. So I went home, learned all the basics really quickly and started working. Now I went from startup to startup um, and 2010, I went out of the office of one of those startups. It was 5 p.m. in the afternoon. There was a guy with long hair sitting on the street playing a guitar and it was a backpacker guitar. It was exactly the guitar that I wanted to buy at that time. So I went up to him and asked him if I could try the guitar and he said, yeah, for sure. So I was playing and he told me this amazing story. It was Javier, it was his name from Barcelona and he had a painting business in Barcelona. But one day, and I just met him two days ago in Granada and he told me the real story. It was even more crazy than I used to tell it. He went to the beach. <laughs> well, I don't know if I should say that here. He went to the beach and basically met this girl who uh, I already saw it, said his name, so I have to change the story a little bit and make it not too crazy. So I met a girl, fall in love. They went, she had a camping van. He told his parents that they should sell everything he has. And uh, they went into the camping van, drove to Africa, and then went from Spain to Mali. And in Mali, they had no money left, so they sold the camper for twice, 2.5 times the money. And then they split. They weren't in a relationship anymore. And Javier hitchhiked back to Spain, bought another Mercedes, drove it back to Gambia and sold it. And he did that four times in a row. So he always came back to Barcelona, but just for two days and then got a new Mercedes, went back and managed to live that way four years in, in Africa, always selling the Mercedes and then living with the money he made um, in Africa. And I was like, isn't it dangerous to drive a car through for Africa? And he said, no. Um, and while I was playing, he taught me everything I, I, I need to know and he took away all my fear. So at that time, I had this fundraising event. I was working at a, a better place, which is like a, a, a fundraising platform. And they had a new feature called fundraising events. So many people, you know, you could win uh, a T-shirt with the signature of the German football players if you come up with a funny fundraising event. So mine was like, I would um, gather money for Street Kids in Namibia and everybody who donated $15 or more could wish a song and then I had to perform this song. So I sang like Kylie Minogue songs and 
all sorts of songs on the, here on the roof of Daimler, like Chrysler, of Mercedes, and, and I had a lot of fun, and I was raising money for, for a good cause. And I always thought, man, I want to do this all around the world. It would be so much fun. But I had no money at all. So I don't know why, but coincidence of fate, the next day I found this video contest from Ford. So Ford was releasing the new Ford Focus, and you could win 10K plus um, the Ford Focus for six weeks with all expenses paid and the weekend on the racetrack in Madrid with like US ra race car celebrities. So you had to make a video. I made this video and won. And a couple of days later, I had to kick in giant footballs into giant goals using a Ford Focus. The funny thing is when I told people before I had won that uh, there is this contest, everybody said, no, it's so much effort. You have to make a video. And then thousands of people make a video and then you can't win. But guess what? 400 people sent a video and 50 people won. So it was a one to eight chance, which I think is a, is a very good chance. And my life is about making videos. Everything I made, I, I like sponsors, press coverage. I always did it with videos. Later, later, I talk. I, I show you how. So I had the money, so I bought a backpacker guitar and the uh, matching Mercedes, and I went from uh, Berlin through about 18 countries to the Democratic Republic of Congo. And there's lots of stories, but we don't have a lot of time. So I just show you this. This is my blood results uh, when I was in Congo, and it basically says that I had malaria, as you can see there. So I had malaria in Congo, and I was hallucinating, and I had like high fever, but it was the best thing that, that ever happened to me. <laughs> I'll tell you why. So I was in bed, and I was like sometimes I would wake up in the bathroom without knowing how, how I got there. And I would uh, wake up spinning circuits and no idea why. In Africa, it's really hard to get by like milk, uh, butter, uh, cheese, everything made of milk, you can't really find it. So I was hallucinating about pizza with cheese on it and, and milk for, for days and I couldn't stop it. You, you get, you're, you're like in this place with your consciousness where you can't stop thinking about certain things and then you wake up just for 15 minutes and like why did i think about this for eight hours anyway so i had wi-fi and i googled random things like cat videos and uh, the craziest work records of the world just to keep my mind busy and not become totally mad and at one point i, I typed in the coolest job of the world internet and i was not looking for a job but i found a job offer from a company in san francisco and um, I, they had an online application form, which I left blank. So I just, they had like name, last name, some multi-line text feel like this about the motivation, why you want to work, upload your CV. I left all this blank and just put Fabian in my phone number in Congo. And the next day they called me and I was like, they were like, why did you apply for this job? And I had no idea what I applied for, but I went quickly to the website, which was zendesk.com. And was like, ah, yeah, customer, yeah, I always, you know, customer service, blah, blah, blah. So I improvised the whole thing, and two weeks later, I sold the car and went to London, put on a suit, you know, from this to wearing a suit in two weeks. And then I was uh, employed, and it was really scary, because I saw myself as this guy, right, this freaky, weird, lone wolf adventurer who goes through Africa in a car, and now I had to go to this competitive startup world but and the career counselor had said you know we, we need this linear cv and so i was now competing with all these linear people i thought but guess what happened in london they they really my boss said once yeah we knew we, you were a little bit weird but that's why we employed you <laughs> i didn't have to change myself at all you know just by not looking like this anymore when going to clients but um there's so much you learn when you travel which is like the out of the box thinking no Startups are always about being disruptive and disrupt something. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's easier to be disruptive if your life is a little bit disruptive too, because then new ideas come into your mind by traveling around and meeting all these different people. You know? It's like an operating system, like the brain being an operating system, and then you travel and you install all these weird, uh, different plugins from other operating systems, which then lead to different ideas, which in young, innovative companies like Zendes at that time, are very uh, appreciated. And if you learn like to negotiate in places like this, you also learn how to negotiate in, uh, in the business world. Now, so there I was, um, I was based in London, but I had like 150 flights in a year and a half. And 
I was going to meet clients and doing boot camps all around Europe. And um, I was working like 80 hours each week, but happily, because I was so happy that after just traveling around Africa, I could now be pro productive again and cross things off my to-do list. And this is all because of this fish, basically. <laughs> so at this time, I had a friend. He was very high in the hierarchy at Renault. He was like the product manager of, of, of one of Renault's cars. But he was losing his mind. He, he became sort of crazy because he worked so much and had so much stress in his life that his body gave him a sign that he has to change something. It was a tinnitus. So he heard this constant in his, in his brain and he couldn't sleep for 18 months. So I met him after a year of not having seen him and he was in, institutionalized at one point. And, um, he tried everything like yoga therapy, sports, all sorts of fun things you can do. And nothing helped. So I suggested he should do something completely different and go to the Amazon rainforest and change his environment a little bit and maybe, you know, drink some ayahuasca, whatever you do there. And he said, well, will you bring me there? And I was like, will you pay my flight? And he said, yes. And like, I took all my holidays. I had a Zendes and then we went to Peru. And he was with, with the shaman for a month. But at this place, with all this rain, I thought I can't keep on like that. No, I was working 80 hours each week, loving it, but still, I need, I need the balance back. So I went back to uh, the office and I scheduled a meeting with my boss. And this is now four of the original slides from that presentation. I just copied and pasted it yesterday into this presentation. So I said like, hey boss, this is my time at Zendes. It was great. I had, the, I had purpose, I had autonomy, I had mastery, I, I could use my language skills. I was always in the learning zone. I had the most motivated colleagues I ever saw and free food. So, but then I went on and this is the happy me. And I was very honest with my boss. I said, I love to, you know, cross the Lake Togo in one tree boats and go to the tech conferences and play guitar and whatever. And I said, yeah, you know, uh, now I could do what I always did, which is quitting my job and then finding a new job when I stop traveling. Or maybe we find some sort of agreement. And the agreement in my, in my head was I would get the same salary, but only work three days a week. And he said, no fucking way. <laughs> but there was a different suggestion that came up. And he said, well, you could maybe fund your own company. And then in the beginning, we help you by sending you some customers along. And that's what happened. So then I was the founder and CEO of this company, Helpando. And that was great. So I moved back to Berlin and from that moment on, I knew that every hour I was putting in was invested in something that I had created. You know? And I had, a lot of, I had a lot of freedom. I worked in Jamaica and in other places and it was going great, but kind of, I kind of knew what's going to happen. It was going good and I knew I could grow it. I could employ more people. I could uh, probably make a lot of money, but I knew what was going to happen. And that sounded like something has to happen that I don't know what happens. <laughs> it was too easy somehow. So six months later, I was in Argentina buying the new office and uh, meeting Dominic and Vin, my business and travel partner. And it was the beginning of this adventure that has me standing here. So our plan was to go through South America and see if we can manage our company from the role. And we had daily calls, we had you know, data migrations to run, we had trainings, and we would record our adventures in the form of episodes that we would release in the internet. And on the same hand, we would meet other people who we called the Che Guevara of work, so people who work differently, people who redefine them, the way of how work is done. And we would interview them and also put this into our episodes. And that's what we did. So we went through Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, Peru, uh, Ecuador, and Colombia, where then I traveled with Diego for a while. That's, that's him. <laughs> and we were interviewed. We interviewed a lot of people. But, you know, at the end, it's like a fish sent me on all this adventure. And now I'm telling you how we m launched one of our biggest projects from a cyber coffee with chicken running around with our mobile office standing outside of the door while the kids were listening to reggaeton and playing counter-strikes. It's, it's, it's very crazy that it's happened. And I think there's some lessons to be learned from, from, from this, what has happened to me. And 
it's really important. So first of all, never miss an opportunity for free food, you know, especially if there's salmon involved. And if you see a guy with a backpacking guitar, you need to go and talk to him, especially, you know, if it's a backpacking guitar. And next time you have malaria, then make sure you Google for jobs. <laughs> if this doesn't say it all, it's, 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 no, I think there's some real lessons to be learned here. And I, you know, if I sit down and look at everything that happens, this is where I think is what happened. So I see that, you know, the world is like, you have 95 or 90% of people who kind of do what the career counselor would say, you know, the linear path, the, you know, what your parents would expect you to do, what society basically expects you to do. And if that's so many, it means that there's a lot of competition because if everybody does the same thing, then the competition is very high. But automatically, if you're part of the 5% who do it differently, it means sometimes that the competition is even lower and that because of that, it's easier to, to succeed. So that's one thing. Now, nothing of this thing that happened to me was planned. It was like this, you know, I walk on the street and then there's a guy who says, drive through Africa and I do it. Or I Google for jobs and they, if they would have given me a job in the gorilla park at that moment, I would have said yes too. It's just about this mindset that, you know, uh, I think I always base decision on how much anecdotal value comes out of a decision. And I would now be probably the manager of a gorilla park instead of CEO of some customer service company. But I think it's, you know, it's uh, being open to, to things. And, you know, some, some might call it the law of attraction. I have any esoteric explanation for those kind of things. I don't believe in that. I think it depends on your mindset. No, serendipity might just be that your brain is trained for certain stimuli, stimuli, and then you find the stimuli in the external world and then they slip into consciousness and you're like, oh my God, this is like magic. So if I would not have talked to the guy with a backpacking guitar at one street corner, I would probably have gone to the next. And there would have been someone who would say, go to Malaysia. And then I would, and this it's, I don't think it's magic. It's just being open and then being open automatically presents you with so much more opportunities. And it's just a numbers game. If you present yourself to 1000 opportunities, then for sure there's four good ones. But if you only have four opportunities, they might not all be good. So it's just, trying a lot of things and, and, and talking to a lot of people. One thing I think which made this possible is the University of the Streets. No? I traveled since I'm um, uh, 20, now I'm 34, and everything I learned and everything I have came to me because I traveled. No? It's the learning Spanish and French and German and English, or well, German I knew already, <laughs> but um, the company I have just because I traveled the job at Zendes, just because I catched malaria in Congo, everything was random. No, everything was, and then this, I thought I go to Zendesk and then I thought I can't make it there. I knew I could travel through Africa, but going to Zendes sounded such a, like such a big challenge because I never had a five day a week job. But then I really was appreciated how the way I was like to have a problem and then finding a creative solution for it which there's no solution established for yet. This is exactly what you learn when you, when you travel. No? So I would think the streets are a great um, university. Now, one thing I also learned is that the world is not a dangerous place. Nowhere where I went. Maybe Northern Brazil sometimes a little bit, but that's the only place where I was a little bit afraid. I went through Nigeria, I went through Congo. Nothing ever happened to me. Not, not one single scratch. And I drove a car alone. No problem. It's, you know, there's uh, my favorite, there's a Nigerian author called um, Shimananda Adichie. And she once said in an interview, she has a great TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story. She once said, if everything I knew about Africa was from the media, I would think that Africa is a place full of exotic, beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and people dying of hunger, poverty, and AIDS, fighting senseless wars and hoping that some white man comes and saves them. But then you go to Africa and you see nothing of that. Everything is the most friendly people, the most hospitable people. You know, in the Muslim country, like the scariest com country, if you go to the webpage of the foreign ministries, is Mauritania. Landmines, kidnappings, Boko Haram, suicide bombers, 
everything you can imagine and it says on the website of the German foreign ministry don't go there ever something like that so we went there we were pretty afraid and then people would leave their beds and sleep on the ground so we could sleep in the beds and there was no way of convincing them to do otherwise and they were not waiting for anything in return some some moment i was playing the guitar in the street there was a car driving by and we were all like oh my god they're gonna explode or something and then he handed out like a, a souvenir and they were like hey you want to take this and i was like no no i don't want to buy anything there i'm like i want to sell it to you as a present <laughs> because you guys are here playing the guitar I was like, all right so Mauritania at the end was a was an amazing experience, not a dangerous place. So I guess we all here are some sort of entrepreneurs, and there's many definitions for entrepreneurs. I guess there's the kind of entrepreneur with like Steve Jobs with his vision and you're disrupting in some industry and you're building the next hot thing. And that's great, I think. And then there's, you know, I see myself more as an entrepreneur who I run this company, I love what I do, I love the jobs that I do, I love to hack away in the console and doing data migrations and talking to clients and all that. Um, but it's not like my passion to do data migrations, right? It's not like what my heart asks me to do. But I found a way of combining it, not to travel and at the same time run this company and it works. So I guess it's it's a good idea to define what success means means for one. And for me, it means that I can have calls while sitting on the toilet, pressing the move button when I flash it, or being in flip-flops in cyber coffees in Peru uh, with chicken running around and me like closing one of our biggest deals, or you know crossing continents in fucked up cars. That's uh, for me the, the success at the moment. Maybe it changes, but at the moment it's this. So this is kind of part one, how I got where, where I am. So let's talk about some hands-on um, knowledge and things I learned while managing the company from the road. So something you have to know is that when in Berlin, I worked maybe eight to 10 hours a day on this thing. I had not much time. And then we went to South America and suddenly we had the same workload, which before we did an eight hours a day, but then we had to interview people, contact people, edit videos, publish videos, uh, travel 20,000 kilometers, through six countries, deal with car problems. And, you know, the whole infrastructure was gone. We had no stable Wi-Fi. We had no um, second screen. We had no desks. We had no chairs. We had no favorite lunch spots. But it has worked out somehow, you know. And I want to talk about how we were able to do that. So. In the beginning, when we came to South America, it was just overwhelming because we didn't know how to edit videos. We didn't know how to interview people. And we had to learn all that. There was a lot of challenges. And I want to show the challenges and then how we solved them. So one thing, of course, battery power. How do you run charge your computers? And I already told you we had solar panels. So these are two solar panels which feed into two different batteries, which are here below the driver's seat. And there's a fridge. The fridge was on 24-7 and never lost um the, the batteries were never uncharged because there was a lot of sun and now i'm here in uh i went down from berlin to here also there was enough sun for recharging all the devices so we had three macbooks three phones uh two ipods two cameras and we always recharged all of it in the car usually connectivity you know the the biggest issue and um i lived in chile in 2004 for a year and since then, I went back to Chile um, three times. And every time I came there, the internet situation was so much better. It's not only that you have more public places like, you know, let's Wi-Fi hotspots at uh, hostels like here in Cartagena in Colombia. It's also that um, the 3G connection, like the prepaid SIM cards that you can buy for 2 to $5, depending on the country, they have way more network coverage. And just one anecdote, I was taking a bus from Santiago de Chile to Valparaiso and I got a notification from a Google calendar saying, hey, you have a call and I forgot about it. So I was called with the client. The bus had no Wi-Fi, but I had my iPhone with a $2 prepaid SIM card and I was able to use the connection of my iPhone on the computer and do a Skype call with the client in a moving bus in Chile. This, that was like 
a year ago. So you can see how drastically the situation improves there. So you have petrol stations, no? uh, like here, with Wi-Fi. And this is a really handy tool. It's like a modem, and you can lock into the Wi-Fi hotspot of the petrol station, and then we would go into our Jeep, and sometimes we would hide this somewhere, like below a tree or something, in the middle, in the, in the way between the Jeep and the petrol station, and it then repeats the signal and sends it into the Jeep, and we would walk uh, from there. Cellular connections was absolutely essential. In every country, we bought a 3G SIM card, 2 to $5, and then you can recharge a gigabyte of data for 7 to $10, more or less. Um, and, you know, this is a typical activity, sitting in some tech cab or bus, you see the blue bar there at the top of the screen, that means you're using the phone's connections or the tethering. Um, but, and then there's an interesting thing that we did for data migrations, because data migrations means that we have to, let's say, read 50 gigabytes of data from one place and then move it somewhere else. And of course, we can't do that with the hostel Wi-Fi or with our phone Wi-Fi, because it's 50 gigabytes. And even in the hostel, it wouldn't be fast enough. But what we did is we have a migration server, which is somewhere in the US, and then we lock onto this migration server via the command line, and then we would issue the command of saying, read the data. So the data is being read on the migration server. The migration server had a, has a huge bandwidth. And then we would write the data from the migration server to the destination. So everything we need to send to the migration server is little text commands on the command line. And we can do that with an edge connection. You know the E in the phone with, when it's super slow? We, we, we were literally doing data migrations while driving in the desert with an edge connection. And it just worked most of the times. So um, what is very interesting about this is that sometimes we had no internet. So we had to drive through the desert. And then the typical thing is, you know, there's a village, they have 3G, so you download your emails, and then you have five hours of no internet, so you can respond to the emails in the car while driving, and then you go into the next village and you upload the emails. So, you know, I once had this uh, breakdown somewhere uh, where I couldn't move on, and I talked to my Land Rover friend who drove four years to Africa in a Land Rover, and he... We couldn't figure out the problem. I thought he can give me like remote support. So I sent him little videos on Facebook about the car, how the car was blowing up, but it didn't work. So at the end he said, dude, I have to sleep now, but remember the interruptions are the way. And you know, you have these cliche things about life is the journey, not the destination, but the Land Rover version of that, because it's always broke, is the interruptions are the way. And I kind of make, it didn't make sense to me then, but now it makes sense because the coolest things happened when we had interruptions, but also it influenced majorly how we worked. So, for example, in Berlin, I have constant internet. I would always get distracted. New email coming in, I would directly respond to that email because I love when customers get an answer after two minutes. You know, I would go on Facebook and check things, and um, I would get interrupted a lot. Now, if you don't have internet, that's not possible. So when I'm coding, I would not just write code that, fix, that solves the problem in the quickest way, but also in a, in a nice way, no? that the code is uh, reusable and others can understand it. So when you're in the desert stuck and you have no internet, you change how you code, for example, or you, how you work. You know, all these start important marked emails in your inbox that need a long response and they're not so important and they're sitting there for a half year, for years. When you're not having anything else to do, you respond to those emails. You take more time to respond to emails. You write better emails because instead of just answering this one question from the customer, you can then take the time to also think about the different questions that the customer will have when he reads the email or she. And then you can point out the different options, you know, answering questions beforehand so there's not so much back and forth. And many of the cloud tools work offline, you know, Google Docs, you know, you have um, email which you can download and then work on the email when you're, um, uh, when you're offline. And you can save money, you know, anti-social and freedom, those apps that block your Facebook access, you don't need them if you're stuck in the desert anymore. So um, nothing improved our efficiency more than having limited connectivity sometimes. Now, we had the work overload, you know, eight hours in Berlin, and now we maybe had two hours uh, for the same um, workload. And I think I analyzed this, you know, I think one hour we saved or because I wasted it in Berlin. I was sitting around saying, okay, it's two, I'm done. But the normal people, they work until six, so I better sit around and stretch my tasks so they fill up the whole day. 
I, I couldn't just stop at two because everybody else was working until six. But if you know that if you stop your work, you can go to a waterfall or to you know go fishing or hike on a mountain, you have these incentives every day that make you work uh, more focused and then you don't waste so much time anymore. Now, um, also pressure sometimes was a huge issue. So knowing that now you have a time window of two hours where you have internet, then you, you, know, you think twice if you go on Facebook or if you do things that are not related to the internet connection. You really, you, you, you get into another mindset where you just think, okay, two hours, I have to finish this now. And then you work so much faster and more efficient. Now that explains more or less three hours. And I think one or two hours we saved by using the tools, the right tools in the right way. And we became experts of that because when you're in the car and you have nothing to do for eight hours, you think about how could I improve the way I work? What shortcuts could I create so I could work uh, more efficiently? And I want to talk about this a little bit, about, um, about shortcuts and, and the tools that we use. So let's, let's do some example here. Let's say, so think about, for example, think about a client who wants to, to, to have a call with you. You know, usually it would be, hey, Fabian, I need a call with you. And then I would be like, Hmm, what time zone are you in? Are you PST or GMT plus two or EST or whatever? They never say that. They think we're all in PST in San Francisco or somewhere. So they would get back to me and say, yeah, hey, we're PST. Then I would have to go to Google, to my Google calendar and look, you know, okay, PST. You know, I, I have PST here, so I always see the PST zone time, and here's my time. So I would think, okay, I have something free. And then the worst would be to offer one slot. The best, better is to offer like three slots, and then the client chooses one. But then still the client goes back, maybe says, no, I can't. So it's a lot of back and forth, maybe four or five emails until the call is scheduled. So what I do instead, if I write an email, so let's say I have an editor here. Oh, I have to move this here. Now, I would, let's say this is an email I'm writing, right? So I'm never writing any emails anymore. I have these, 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 these shortcuts to, to uh, insert in my email program, and then I would just exchange the name. You know? But I also have a shortcut called CAL, and if I apply that, it says, hey, if you'd like to have a call, feel free to pick a date and time that suits you here, and I will ultimately receive a notification. Now I could go here and open this link, and if the client opens this link, he will see my available slots. It's called Calendly, you know? like um, this Calendly. And then this is synced with my Google Calendar. So let's say here's, this is Friday, October 30. If I go to my calendar, I can see that on Friday, I have to pick up Sylvia and Malaga and go to Marrakesh. And that's why here it's not free anymore because it's blocked. So the client can only choose the slots that are free. So 9.15 AM, this is automatically translated to the time zone of the client. So if he's in PST, he sees this translated into PST time zones. And then the client would say confirm, and uh, yeah, here you can leave your name, and then the email address, and Skype username, and if you do not use Skype, what is the landline number? And here I'm just applying a shortcut that I had to have to put in my phone number. That's another shortcut, and I would then schedule this event. And now if I go into my calendar and I reload this, probably it might be in there now. Yeah, there you see. XXX, 30 minute meeting. And then here in the details, I can see, okay, this is from this person. This is the Skype username, this is the landline number. So this, this saved us an amazing amount of time because it's five emails versus outsourcing the work to the client by just sending a link to the client and he does or she does all the work, which is, which is great. Now, another of these examples and this is, of course, depending on, on the businesses that you do or will have or whatever, is there's certain things that are being repeated in the conversations that we are having with clients. For example, if they need a data migration, they would always, we would always ask the same question. What is the source system you're migrating from? How many tickets do you need to migrate? Do you need ticket attachments? Do you have any custom fields? So why should we waste our time? 
because call you need to be at a place, you need to have good internet. So we want to avoid calls uh, as much as it, as, it, as it goes. So what we did instead, we, we created a tool which is called our scoping tool. And now instead of calling the customer or sending all this question via an email, we would just send them this link, scoping.helpando.it, and they would say, okay, we need a data migration. And then it, asks, it tells you, yeah, give us one minute. And then what system are you migrating from? Well, I'm migrating from OTS. What do you want to migrate? Tickets and associated users? Yes. How many tickets do you have? 500K to 700K. Do you need ticket attachments? Yes. Uh, where are the attachments stored? I don't know. Do you need a complete switch over? You know, yeah, I want to do this and that. Next, oops. And then at the end of this, you know, they leave, that's it now, I think. I never did this myself. Okay, attachments here and there. We had 86% and when you're done, then timeline, anything else? No. Okay, so you put in your name and your email. As soon as the client clicks on finish, we get an email with a really nice table which shows us all the different details about the data migration, and then we get back to the client. So we saved the call, we saved a lot of work. So it makes sense to sometimes when you do repetitive stuff to think if you can sort of build a tool for it and then send that to the client instead, which is the same as, is that a question? Yeah. yeah. Well, right. well, in our case, it's a bit different because when clients come to us, they're usually sent to us by Zendesk most of the times. So they already trust us and we have kind of a monopoly. So they either do the data migration with us or with no one. So they're kind of forced to do that. But uh, if it's really important, then they, we would still call them. Or sometimes they would say, fuck you tool, we want to have a call. And then we, we also do it, right? So um, I, I see what, what you mean, but usually they do it and, and it, it works great. All right, so back to more things. Like imagine how terrible, like you, you all know command C, command V, right? Copy and paste. Imagine how terribly, Terrible it would be if you don't have that anymore. Like how much time we would lose. Maybe an hour a day. Maybe, you know, it's, 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 how, who would ever type something, which you see in a, in a different place. With the shortcuts I'm using, I think I would, it would be just as terrible to lose them. And it, you know, it takes only a couple of hours to set them up once and then they can use them for a long time. Uh, I think I have to change my display settings here so you can see what I'm seeing. Um, but basically, Okay, so now we're sharing, I'm sharing my screen. So here's some examples. Let's say I'm an, I'm an editor. What always happens in a form on the web is that you have to put in your details. No? So let's say they need my phone number. I would just go use my, um, my thing here, which is the Alfred app, and it has phone Chile, phone Ecuador, all sorts of phone numbers. So I would say phone Chile, and here goes my Chilean phone number. Or I would say uh, phone, my German phone number. You know, sometimes I have couch surface, so they need to know how to get to my place. I have a shortcut, my direction, and it explains how to get to my place. Right? I have, um, what else do I use? I have like this weird command line commands, which are really long in my Alfred app shortcuts like this. This is something I would paste in the command line to you know, write organizations from one Zenless account to another Zenless account, and I can't, of course, memorize that. I could go to Evernote and copy and paste it, but it's so much faster this, like this. And if I do this many times per day, it, it saves a lot of time. Now, also, there's you know, certain documents that I always need. So I could go to drive.google.com and, you know, search for my accounting document and then I would probably find it somewhere and open it. But I open this so many times per day that now I just do command shift A and my accounting I do command shift K and my calendar opens. It doesn't seem like a big difference, but it's so much better than you know the worst would be to go into Chrome and click here and then type calendar or something. 
uh, it would be already better to do like Command T to open a new tab and then CAL and then it auto suggests the calendar. But why not just Command Shift P K? If you do it so many times per day, it makes sense to create these sort of sort of uh, shortcuts. There's also certain things that I do on a regular basis which require to have, let's say, four different browser tabs open. Like, let, imagine you want to in, you're interviewing someone for a podcast. Then you probably have some interview questions on a Google Doc, and you have your Skype and you have your podcast whatever tool. So you need four different things open for different activities. So I have the same. I have a shortcut that is hub and spoke to multi-brand open windows. I start this and it automatically opens four browser tabs that I need for this particular activity. Right? And then I can do this activity. This, this is all really easy to set up. Like if you go into the settings of Alpha. Uh, you can see that there's these sort of workflows. So here you can see for some workflows, you define like a hotkey, like Shift Apple H, and then what this does is opening this document. So it's very, really easy to set this up. You just create the actions and you create the triggers, and then you draw these lines which combines the actions with the triggers, and then that's what they do. And, and it can save you a lot of time. There's sometimes that require a little bit more of, you know, like rudimentary coding skills. But I had one thing that cost me so much time and that I found a better solution for. So here I have a sheet that I use a lot. This is a sheet of different Zendesk accounts that I have to migrate somewhere else. So this is all different names of Zendesk accounts. And what I have to do there every time is to log into each of these accounts and get the API token, like an API key. Now, usually I would take this, I would say copy C, I would go to the browser, I would paste this, and then I would add .zendesk.com slash access slash normal. And then I would go here and I would now log in with my uh, credentials, like with my, with my email. Why is this not opening? I don't know. Here I would put in my email and here I would put in my password and I have to do this in this case 24 times. It's a big, big work. Now instead of this, I can now copy this and I wrote a little script. So it's not perfect yet. So what I have to do, I have to put all this in one line and then separate it with comma. So I, I just replace backspaces, which is backslash n with commas. And then I would say, OK, and now I replace it. And now I have all of these uh, in one line and replace with commas. And now I copy that. And I run a script, which is also outfit up. And I think it's called Open Array of Zenith Account and Browser. And I run this, and it asks me, put in the, the, the different accounts. And I do that. And now if we look at the browser, it just opens all these different tabs. And I save easily half an hour. So the script for this looks like 15 lines of code. Maybe if you can't do it yourself, you can ask someone. But it's, it really makes sense to create these scripts so you can save time uh, with the repetitive things that maybe you have to do. What else? Um, oh, one thing this is so cool. Imagine you have you have A, B, C, D, one, two, three. What happens a lot is you copy something, and then you copy another thing, and another thing. So I'm copying all this with Command-C, right? And then you're somewhere, and you, 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 if I paste now, the last thing I copied is one, two, three. So this is what I'm pasting. But sometimes you're like, hey, I want to paste something that I copied like before. With Alfred app, you just do Command-Alt-C, and here you have the history of the things that you copied before. So now you can paste the beat, which I copied before. It's little things, but if you apply all these together, it saves you an amazing amount of um, time each day. Anything else? Um, yeah, I, I think the philosophy behind this is just that doing things over and over is over. Because if you do things over and over, it means that at some point you will be replaced by some sort of AI, <laughs> probably. All right, I'm, sh I'm putting my screen back. Now, 
next thing here is media coverage. So we during this trip I learned a lot about efficiency. So I was trying to apply the same strategies to other things. Like uh, when I cross when I went through Africa, I needed sponsors. So uh, how, the question was, how do I get to the sponsors, and how can you efficiently approach a lot of people who might be potential sponsors? And what I did I, is I, I recorded small videos, like two minute videos, saying, "This is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I need, and this is what how you benefit if you help us." So I was sending like these little videos to Red Bull or to insurances or to whoever. And I would always say the name of the person that I wanted to reach. So I would say, hi, Martin Zollinger, like some boss from Red Bull. Now, the fun thing is if this video somehow gets to him, he has to say something. If they see that you make a video where you say his name or her name, they feel like they need to respond. Maybe you cannot get to the person directly, but you can and their assistants on LinkedIn, on seeing maybe on Facebook, and you send the videos on Facebook to their assistant. Now the assistant sees it and they're like, oh man, he's mentioning my boss. They for sure forward it. It's really easy to reach everybody if you make custom videos and then send it to people who work for those people. So uh, the conversion rate is amazing. With the, with the Africa trip, I sent 20 videos and five became sponsors. Five and maybe 15 said something. They at least say no. But five became sponsors, so Gravis gave me a MacBook, Just Music gave me a guitar and an amplifier. Uh, I got like little small things from, from different sponsors. Now for media coverage in uh, South America, you know, we were in, in some TV stations, some radios. Um, we did kind of the same thing, but you know, you could think it's a lot of work to make these custom videos, but it's not. Because what we did was very efficient. So we... Um, where is my cousin? It's here. It's here. So what we did is, we first made a list of all the different TV channels, which were like maybe 30 channels. And then I would stand on top of the Land Rover, and Dominic would not be in the picture, and he would dictate me the names of those TV channels. And then all we would do is record a video where we're like, let me see if you can hear this. Hola Ecuador TV. Hola Equavisa. Okay, so we did this 30 times. Hola Gama TV. So we had all that, and then we re re record another video where we're like a minute of talking. Oh no, that's not it. Uh, Oh yeah, this is kind of weird. Hola, Equavisa. Hola, somos unos alemanes un poco locos. Tenemos una empresa juntos que dirigimos desde nuestra so oficina. So we were just saying who we are, what we do, and what we need. Now, since we recorded the hola 30 times, we could just set this in front of this video. And then we had a mass production of videos. Maybe in one hour we had 30 videos, uploading them on YouTube overnight. And then we had a friend in uh, Valencia who would then send this to all these different TV channels. So from 30 or 25 videos sent, six invited us, and then we ended up in, in uh, all these TV channels. <laughs> and it, it worked great. Does anybody know this guy? No? He's like the biggest Mariana smuggler of the world. And at, at one place, at one point, he had his premiere of his movie in Berlin, and they said, yeah, you want to have a dinner with Howard Marks, Mr. Nice? then send us an email and tell us why you want to meet him. And instead of sending an email, I sent a video. And then I was having dinner with the... <laughs> so I think there's, there's two lessons here. One is that if you make a video, it always works. <laughs> you mention the person by name and then send it on weird ways to, uh, to the assistants or whoever. And the other thing is, again, being disruptive. So in order to meet Mr. Nice, you had to send an email, but instead we send an e an, a video. No, and instead of sending an email to people who you want that you, they sponsor you or they fund you or they write about you or whatever, uh, you could send a, a video. And instead of sending it to the email address rather than delete it, you could, you know, trying to find out who works for them and then send it to them and try that they forward it to, to that person. So 
to wrap things up, when doing Startup Diaries in South America, we were kind of, you know, driving around to meet people who redefine work. And in the process, we redefined work for ourselves. In Berlin, I work eight hours a day. Now I work two because of all these things that we learned in South America because we had no more time. And then we just learned to work in different ways. Um, we don't waste any time anymore because if you have these amazing things to do after work, you think twice if you, you know, uh, waste your time on uh, Facebook. And if you want to keep on struggling with crappy Wi Fi signals. So for me now, this idea applies to meetings, to prioritizing, to technology in general. And then travel, you know, helps to pick up so many things that are also great for business, the improvisation skills, you know, the being confronted with problems that you never were confronted with before and then finding a solution for it. Because if you're somewhere in a, in a known environment, somebody already knows how to solve things. But if you're alone or, you know, traveling in weird places, you really learn how to do this. The, the empathy, the decisiveness, the time management, uh, and so much more. And it has shown in studies that you have a competitive advantage at your workplace if you were traveling for uh, longer times. Yeah, I think everybody knows WordPress, right? WordPress now powers 23% of all web pages that are now on the internet. It was created by a Mullenweg 19 year old guy who slept two hours when he uh, coded it. And it's a perfect example of how things are changing. They have 400 employees now. They have one small office where you know it fits 20 people, and people only go there to pick up T-shirts. They don't write any emails. There's no internal email at WordPress. They do everything in Slack, you know, the, the chat. Uh, if they employ new people, they don't interview them on the voice channel or they meet them. They interview them in chat. Only not if it's salespeople, because there they want to know how they're talking and stuff. But no offices, no managers, no internal email. It's all gone. And I think that's, you know, where the future is going. Work is really not a place anymore. And with that, with that, of course, comes the unique set of challenges. Um, you know, how do you deal with not having a coffee machine anymore, a water spender where people meet randomly and talk about things that you're not supposed to? To like which were not planned, but there's solutions for that. And you know, um, if I had to sum up this whole adventure, it was creative ad adaptability. You know, we had to find solutions for things that we were never confronted with, from media outreach strategies, uh, how to deal with crappy Wi Fi, how to improvise, how to use these things to the max. And I would like to end with the following. This is from our last episode, uh, the eighth one, which you can find on Startup Diaries. We were in the jungle for a team incentive because we were very stressed. So we met Papa Julio, who's a shaman, and this is like a ceremony with some plant medicine. And, you know, we always define ourselves uh, with as a nomad company, which is a good definition, but it misses kind of the idea. And while sitting here, I had I had a like kind of a, 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 a better idea of why we do that. You know, we are, we are location independent, but we're not only that. Instead, we give ourselves the freedom to live our lives however we choose to. You know? To be on these adventures, driving cars through continents, and you know, running data migrations from cyber coffee to chicken running around, and this independence or any independence that you choose, you know, gives you the room to fill your life with, with purpose and, and pleasure and to live it however you want. And be yourself and free of inhibitions, you know. We are free of the inhibition of going to work every day or, you know, we can wear whatever dirty clothes we choose to when on a call with our US customers or in the desert of Peru. And this is the kind of thinking that I hope you take out of this talk and that I hope I can leave you with. So, thanks. <laughs> thanks. That's it. Any 